Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, colleagues. It really is an honor to give this speech today, to give the speech in the chamber that has developed me so much personally, and it's also developed me so much professionally. The truth is I have many friendships that I have made in this chamber and in this town that will never be replaced. And I have made so many memories that I will always cherish and that I will never forget. In January of 2019, this body, the member sitting here, you gave me the opportunity of a lifetime. You granted me the title of Speaker of the House. I hope in these last two years, by my conduct, by my behavior, and by my attempts of fairness, it is not just a title that you have granted me, but it, it is now a title that I have earned. I always attempted to tell the truth and to live up to what I said I was going to do. I will make one small note. If by chance there were to ever be a member, hypothetically, who would like to say that I did not keep my word, and if that member, hypothetically, would like to say I did not keep my word during a speech, just remember, bearing false witness against your neighbor is in fact the Eighth Commandment and not the Fourth. Now, I would not want to call any member out that would do such a thing, but unrelated, Leader Greg, <laughs> I would like to tell you it's been an honor serving with you. It's been a pleasure fighting alongside you, sometimes in agreement and sometimes in disagreement. But the fact is, we had many challenges put before us in this 100th legislature, and we did the best that we could. I've always appreciated your passion and your fight, and I've also always respected your beliefs. It's been a pleasure serving with you for six years. Thank you. But this year did bring us many unprecedented challenges, ones that we could not have predicted, ones that we could not have foreseen. These challenges brought a lot of confusion in our state and country. It led to anger, it led to division, and it led to fear. Our country needed real leaders to step up. Sometime, sometimes I rose to that challenge and sometimes I did not. But rather than viewing what we're facing in our country today as a problem, let us change that and view it as an opportunity where we can step up and show real solutions and real bipartisanship. You know, it was said to me early on in this term. It was some of the best advice that I received and I didn't really understand it at first, but I do now. It was told to me, don't attempt to be a mountain climber in this job. The truth is, when you look at what a mountain climber does, they've got determination, they've got tenacity, and they work hard. But when that mountain climber reaches the peak and looks around, they're all by themselves. The truth is, you can be a good person on your own. You can be a good legislator on your own. But you cannot be a good leader on your own because people will be there with you. God knows this country needs more leaders rather than people simply making it about themselves in this political career. You know, when we do that and work together, we've had some of the greatest accomplishments in this chamber that this state has seen in the past 50 years. The biggest reform that we accomplished that I'm so incredibly proud of is a reform that eluded this state for 30 years, something that eluded this chamber for 30 years, and that is lowering the cost of car insurance. It was the number one issue that was holding our state back from taking the next step economically. And we allowed people in our state, by having their car insurance rates reduced, to have more money in their pocket so they can put more food on the table and they can take care of their family. We should all be incredibly proud of that, and we did it in a bipartisan way. We also made great criminal justice reforms, as was mentioned earlier in the speech just before me. Some of that was on expungement, and civil asset forfeiture. We made changes that there will be effects that we don't see right now, but we will, only see, we will only see decades later. We gave people a second chance. We gave people a fresh start. We gave people the opportunity to now be contributing members of the society in a society that had previously said, you will not get a restart. We should all be proud of that. Some of the biggest hearts that I have ever seen or people that I have ever worked with are individuals in this chamber. Some 
on the left side of the aisle, some on the right. And this reform never would have gotten done without their passion and without their fight. And I don't mean to take a partisan tone, and I hope this is not taken the wrong way. But when I think of big wins for this institution, another big win for this institution was the Supreme Court win, where they decided that the 1945 law was unconstitutional. You see, the Constitution is still the Constitution, and separation of powers still exists, even during a pandemic. Not everyone in this chamber might view that court case as a win, but I hope in due time that we will. Because when we are a part of this institution, we should be concerned about being the voice of the people. Now, in my personality, Mr. Speaker, I'm not someone who is just proud of the things that we did together, but I can't help but reflect on the things that we did not. And at the end of the day, the buck stops here. And I apologize about some of the major reforms that we didn't accomplish. The first that comes to mind is fixing our crumbling infrastructure. Until the members in this chamber, myself included, have the political fortitude to do what needs to be done to fix the roads, they're always going to be in tough shape. Until every penny that's paid in taxes at the pump is a penny that goes towards roads, our infrastructure will always crumble. Though we took many strides to do this this year, we didn't finish it out, and I wish the next legislative term the absolute best of luck. But we need to increase access to health care across our state and we need to increase access to mental health services. Some of what we just did in the supplemental is a step towards that, but we have so much to go. Unfortunately, our county jails are still flooded with people who are mentally ill who need services that they cannot receive in the county jails, and they deserve better from us. And I, I do wish the next leaders more fortitude to get that done. We also need to increase rural broadband. COVID showed us deficiencies in our law, but it also showed us deficiencies in access to internet, which now during COVID means you don't have the same access to education. It also means you don't have the same access to representation before the courts, and we need to do better. Early on in this term, in January of 2019, I said I wanted to ensure that we had an element of respect in this chamber, where people were treated fairly, where we had civility. I appreciate Clerk Randall for always helping me along the way to do that. But I am sorry for the times when I did not live up to that standard. I am sorry for the times that I did not live by my own words. I'm also sorry for the times when we could not reach a consensus with this administration and with the Senate. When you select the Speaker of the House, you select someone to be the lead negotiator for this House. It was not due to a lack of effort, but there were times where we could not reach a deal. And I apologize. That ends with me. I also apologize for not including enough people in the process. There's many members in here who have incredible amounts of expertise in a certain area, and I didn't listen enough, and I apologize. And last, I apologize if there was ever a time I did not listen. Every single person in here represents the same number of people, and you're their voice. And sometimes that voice was not heard in these chambers, and I apologize. There's many things I would change if I could do it over again, Mr. Speaker. And though history may not say that I did everything right, what I will tell you is I did everything I thought was right. But what was mentioned in other speeches before me is incredibly true. I have had six incredible years to walk into this building, walk into this room every single day in awe and appreciation of the opportunity we have to serve in this country. We have an incredible tradition. Our country has always been a shining city on a hill, a beacon of hope for the world, and we always will be that shining city on a hill. Psalm 33, 12 said, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And let me tell you, our nation is truly blessed. It's one thing to talk about making America great, but a more important thing is talking about the actual principles that made our country great in the first place. I do believe this country was built on Christian values, and I believe history documents that. I believe this country was built on freedom, on faith, on the idea of individual responsibility. This country was built on conviction. But this country was also equally built on compromise. It was built on conviction and compromise. And we as legislators, and I am number one on the list, need to do a better job at finding how we can compromise on our policies without compromising on our principles. 
You know, when I first came into this job, I did so and ran on some ideas and beliefs that were very, very sincerely held by me, by my family, many in my community. I wouldn't change that. Yet at the same time, I've become very good friends with the man that I defeated to take this job. And I think that speaks more to his character than it does mine. But it's simply a realization that this job is bigger than you. This job is bigger than your opinions. This job is even bigger than your beliefs. Some of the legislators who I consider to be some of my closest friends are on the other side of the aisle or in the other chamber, and we disagree on a lot of ideas. Many of the original haters when I first came into this town are now friends. They haven't changed my mind on everything and I haven't changed theirs. But the fact is we have a mutual respect for one another. And we need to do better, than, we need to do better of that here in this chamber, getting to know people on the other side of the aisle, reaching out and having a mutual understanding. Now, I don't want anyone to misunderstand what I'm saying or misinterpret what I'm saying. Because you need to fight for your beliefs and you need to have passion. The fact is this, if you can come into this chamber every day and do what you do without passion, I question the, sin the sincerity of your beliefs. If you can come into this chamber each and every day without fighting for the convictions you believe in and what you told your district you believed in, I question your sincerity at all. But that passion, that fight, should not stop an element of respect. Those are not mutually exclusive. You know, I am reminded of what Henry Ford said. He said, if I would have given people simply what they wanted, I would have given people faster horses. But he thought about what the needs were, and he was an inventor. And that is the difference between a republic and a democracy. In a republic, you're sent here by your constituents to do your homework, to live up to your word, and to do what you think is right. Sometimes doing what you think is right will make people angry. They may not understand. And if the district no longer agrees with what you think is right, they have an opportunity to take you out and send someone else. And we've seen that here in this chamber on both sides of the aisle. You know, it was Abraham Lincoln who said, a compass will tell you what true north is. And for the analogy, true north is what's doing what's right. And it'll point you in the right direction. But that compass will not tell you where the swamps are. That compass will not tell you where the cliffs are. And there may be an element of maneuvering to get where you want to be, because the art of politics is you, if you cannot get everything you want, simply get everything you can. And I'm glad the next two legislative leaders of these chambers are here with me today. First to Speaker-elect Wentworth. The best way I can describe this job, truly, the best analogy I have is it's like going to Disney World. When you show up to Disney World and all the kids are in the car and everyone's excited to get out of the car, you can't wait to check into that line. You can't wait to allow everyone to have some fun and everyone to do what they want to do. But when you have a family, like you're about to have, and it is closing time, you are ready to get out of that park. I am equally as excited to leave this position as I was to get into it. And know this, that when frustrations come, which they will, and tensions come, which they will, without the great war, you would never get the great general. And I truly believe that many of the weaknesses that I've displayed in this job while holding that gavel, you pose as strengths. And I truly believe that the House will be in even more capable hands next term, and I wish you the absolute best of luck. To Senate Majority Leader Shirky, thank you for somehow saying things in the press that made me look reasonable. <laughs> Leader Shirky is known for his quips and phrases, the first of which is, what does good look like? Please remember this, the answer is nothing from the Senate. <laughs> the second of which is you always find what you are looking for. All kidding aside, when I came into this job, I was looking for an honest partner and someone I could trust and work with, and I found that. 
I was looking for a colleague who would treat me fairly and be honest with me, and I found that too. But I found more than that, I found a friend. You've been a mentor to me. I love you and your family. And there's no one else I would have rather gone to war with in the Senate than you. You've been a heck of a partner, and we've accomplished some great things. Thank you, and I wish you the best of luck in your relationship with Speaker-elect Wentworth. Like so many before me, I'd be remiss if I did not say a few thank yous during this speech, people who helped me get here. And I apologize because I cannot name everyone. But first, I do want to thank my district, the 107th. It has been an absolute honor to represent the same district that I grew up in, the same district that my kids were born in and they have the opportunity to live in now. I was always more proud to ride back into district and see my hometown and know that I had the opportunity to represent them than I was when I rode into Lansing, even when I was Speaker of the House. It's been an honor and I hope I made you proud. To the House Republican Caucus, I'd like to thank you for your trust in me. I know we have not always agreed, and I know there have been many different battles within our caucus, but I hope you believed I was a steady hand. I hope you believed I treated you fairly. Good teams always find a way to win, and that is truly what we did. We accomplished things that caucuses before us could not, but you're more than a team. We became a family this year. I hope you know I love each and every one of you, and I would never have picked another 57 members to go to war with than you. Thank you for placing that trust in me, and I hope you were proud. To my staff of the 107th District and in the Speaker's Office, the senior staff, I hope by how I have treated you the last couple of years, you know that I love each and every one of you. And nothing can replace the memories that we made. From our long disagreements and whiteboard sessions going over policy, to reading our leadership books together and discussing what they meant, to our long debates on swimming in rivers and fishing in lakes, all the way to where's my mic. I want you guys to know I have loved every single minute of it. And there was no better team in town. I cannot name everyone, but I would remiss if I did not name two of those staff. I'd like to thank Rob and Annie Menard. The truth is I would not be where I am without you and I would not be who I am without you. I love both of you and you will always be an extension of the Chatfield family. To my younger brothers in the gallery, Paul, Aaron, and Will, we truly started from the bottom and I will never ever forget the work that you did for me to get me to this place. I love you boys. To my mom and my dad, who are in the gallery. First to my dad. Growing up, we did not have a lot of things. We had seven children and two parents. Because you worked in the ministry, there was not truly enough money to take care of all of us. Thank you for teaching me the value of hard work. Thank you for getting up every single morning at 2 a.m. to deliver papers so you could put food on the table and take care of our family. Thank you for setting that example. Thank you for teaching me what hard work meant and what love for a family meant. Thank you also for your work in the jail ministry. It was your over 35 years of work in the jails that really opened my eyes to the need for criminal justice reform, that really lit a fire in my heart to get that done. We made some real progress this term, but there's more things that need to be done. The state and this chamber owes you a debt of gratitude for that example. Thank you for always reminding me not to forget about what's important, to do what's right, to read my Bible and to pray every day. To my mom, thank you for your love. Thank you for always defending me first, asking questions second. Thank you for finally stopping reading comments on Facebook. I love you and I appreciate all you did for me and that all that you continue to do. Thank you for all the assistance with helping watch our five beautiful children so Stephanie could be a part of this journey with me as well. To my kids, to Lee, Noah, Matthew, Paige, and Lincoln. I know you didn't always understand why daddy was gone, but thank you for trying. I'm sorry for everything that I missed. When I entered this job, you were all babies, and now you're kids. I'm sorry for missing your games. I'm sorry for not being there for your practices. I'm sorry for missing some dance recitals. 
I'm sorry I wasn't there sometimes when you lost teeth. And I'm sorry I wasn't there for dinner. You guys deserve better. You deserve a better dad, and I'm going to strive to do that. I also apologize that when you get older and you learn how to Google, <laughs> especially for my son, Lee, Two of the biggest hits when you Google your name will be Gun in Airport <laughs> and Dom Perignon. <laughs> but I can explain both of those things. Just give me some time. It was about two months ago that I was back home and the kids were in the car and we were driving home and I will admit I was distracted thinking about something else. And my wife said, you're about to miss the driveway. We had the whole family in the car, so rather than slamming on the brakes, I simply decided to drive past and I said, well, it looks like we're gonna get more family time. And the most honest kid in the car, Lincoln, who's three years old, said from the back, what's family time? <laughs> and hopefully soon we will find out what that means. Now, had you listened to Rep Crawford's speech, you will know that I was home some of the time but I'd rather you not listen to that speech. I will teach you about the lessons of life when the time comes. <laughs> also to my wife, Stephanie, the most beautiful woman that I know. You didn't sign up for this, and I'm sorry for everything I missed. We met at 16, we were engaged at 18. We were married at 20, we had our first child at 22, and we had our fifth child by 28. I'm sorry that you had to raise five kids on your own for much of the past six years. I'm sorry for not making the family more of a priority. You've been my rock, and though I've had many supporters, you've always been my number one. I'm sorry for what our family's gone through. I'm sorry about the blackmail. I'm sorry about the threats. I'm sorry that I was gone, and I'm sorry about all the mail that you had to open while I was not there. You've been a rock, and you've done an incredible job with our family, and I'm looking forward to spending more time at home. And in ending, there's a few challenges I'd like to leave with this chamber. A few things that I wish I had known when I first entered. The first is this, your life will shrink or expand in exact proportion to your courage. Be courageous. Do what's right, not always just what's politically expedient. Number two, when frustrations come and things in this chamber are stalled and your bills aren't moving, realize this, you are either giving up or you are getting up. Never stop fighting. There's an equal amount of opportunity in every loss as there is in a victory. And view life in that way. Number three, and this is particularly tough, in a position that we are in by wanting people to know what we've done. And self-promotion. Seek respect and not attention. It lasts much longer. And last, do not fear having a debate on philosophy. The truth is, knowing what your philosophy is should come far before knowing what your policies are. Just as the Declaration of Independence laid out our philosophy of government first, what was born from that was our system of government. We need to ask ourselves more fundamental questions in this town, questions that I wish I had asked more often of my colleagues and my friends and of myself. The first of which is where do rights come from? If truly the Declaration of Independence is accurate and those rights come from our Creator, and it is He that has endowed us with certain unalienable rights, the next logical question is what has He determined is right? And if the Declaration of Independence is accurate and He has told us what is right in the laws of nature and the laws of God, we should be more diligent searching both of those laws when we make the decisions that we do in this chamber. But before all else, know what your philosophy is. The good representative from Ann Arbor, I have been impressed over the last several years of his ability to stand at that microphone and speak of his philosophy, speak of his passion. He can do it at the drop of a hat. Why? Because he believes it. I'm also equally impressed that all of his speeches literally had nothing to do with the bill that was on the board. <laughs> Thank you.
But I will tell you this, he knew what he believed and it challenged me. Hopefully we as legislators can know what we believe as well and we can leave this place better than when we found it. In ending, I truly want you to know this, you have all meant so much to me. Though there will be new challenges in my life and I will be helping the state in a new capacity, I want you to know this, that my heart will always be in this house. I wish you all the absolute best of luck in the years to come in all your future endeavors, and may God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.